great pleasure to be in Turin. Um, I've been to Italy before. It was a long time ago. I was, uh, I was much younger the last time I was here. You were also much younger the last time I was here, as in many of you were in negative numbers. Um, at least they weren't imaginary numbers, right? Um, the, um, one, one of my great memories from the first time I came to Italy was the street signs. You know, every, every American knows certain kinds of Italian words, mostly for food, right? Um, which is a very good thing. But um, if you studied music, as I did, you also know Italian for the musical terms. And so I'd been seeing that sort of thing since the age of nine. So I was uh, going down the street, one of my first experiences in Italy was to see a sign that said Adagio, which I thought was hilarious because I knew it only as a musical term. You know, I expected to go further down the street and see a sign that said Allegro ma non troppo. Sante, Marcato, <laughs> Pizzicato. No, but I didn't see any of those signs. But anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm in Turin for the first time, so now my life is Turin complete. <laughs> Thank you, Jew. <Jim. laughs> so, uh, this talk is about elixir, and I think there are some of you who already know something about elixir. And if you do, you probably won't learn anything today. But if you have never seen it before, if you've never heard of it, maybe you will learn something. So um, let me proceed. I think everybody knows the answer to why do we use Ruby. I think we like it because it's highly object-oriented, has beautiful syntax, it's easy to use. You know, it just fits the way our brains work. You know, for most of us, but I think it's not um, not very good for concurrency. I had a friend who st tried to start more than a thousand threads in Ruby, and he found that uh, some of them would just silently die. Um, if you if you fork operating system processes, it's okay, but the the Ruby threading model and the concurrency in general is not very good. In addition, in addition, some people say that Ruby is slow. Um, I think it depends on what you're using it for and what you're doing. Um, some people say Ruby is adagio. I say it's allegro ma non troppo. <laughs> so, how many of you are familiar with Erlang at all? Some of you, okay, good, good. I, um, I never learned Erlang. I was first exposed to it in, I guess, 2006 or 2007 when I was at a Ruby conference. Somebody gave a short presentation on Erlang, and I thought it was fascinating. And so I, I started trying to learn a little bit more about it, and I quickly found that although it seemed very powerful, it didn't fit my brain. It had all kinds of jagged edges that would stick outside my skull when I tried to cram it inside. So, um, you know, we know that it's, um, it's a functional language, it's highly concurrent, you know, very good for concurrency. The processes are small, fast, and very lightweight. If you're not familiar with Erlang, um, you need to know right away that the processes we are talking about are not operating system processes. They are, they are processes created and managed by the Erlang VM. And so they're very, very small and lightweight. I think on a Unix operating system, you would hesitate to run a program which forked a thousand processes, a thousand operating system processes. I think you would hesitate, I would. Um, in Erlang, Processes are so small that you can easily start a hundred thousand of them and, and never really notice. And they run more or less concurrently and they're managed by the VM. It's, uh, it's all very 
you know, time-tested code over at least a couple of decades. Now, BEAM, if you ever hear that word, I, I can't even remember what it stands for. It's someone's abstract machine, someone's Erlang abstract machine. I forget the guy's name. BEAM is simply the VM for Erlang. And it, um, so every Erlang program is compiled down to, you know, Beam opcodes, you know, sort of similar to Java, but please forget I said Java there. Um, there's also a thing you should be aware of called the OTP, which stood for Open Telecom Platform originally, but now really has nothing to do with telecom. It's just a, a very rich set of libraries for process management and many other things. So that also is a very time-tested code. Now, one thing that makes Erlang special is that it's so good at concurrency and high availability. And there's a wonderful quote from Tim Bray of Sun Microsystems, um, a talk that he gave at OSCON in like 2008 or so. He said, if somebody came to want to pay, pay me a lot of money to build a large scale message handling system, blah, 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 I would unhesitatingly choose Erlang to build it in. So I think that speaks highly of Erlang. Okay, so the next question is, why not Erlang? And I first say ugly syntax, and I put a question mark there because it's you know, strictly a matter of opinion. It's very subjective. And people who have been using Erlang for a long time, if, they, if you tell them it's ugly, they'll get angry. You know, it's like you said their, their child was ugly or something. You know? <laughs> Um, so I don't say that too much, but we're all Ruby people here, maybe I can say it. Uh, there are inconsistencies in Erlang. I think every piece of human technology, whether it's a computer language or something else, has inconsistencies because it's not all designed in advance. It, it grows as we think we need things, you know, just like any other system. So there are inconsistencies and things that are a little old-fashioned because they, they made more sense 25 years ago than they do now, that kind of thing. So there is something in there that I call onions in the varnish, and I stole this phrase from Paul Graham, the Lisp guy, whom you may know. Um, does anyone recognize this guy? This is a test. Nope. Okay. I thought somebody might. You know, I, I wouldn't have either. I had to look up his picture. I just knew his name. This, guy, this is a guy named Primo Levi. And it's interesting to me. I was going to use this uh, story, you know, before I ever came here. But when I was researching Primo Levi, I found that um, he actually spent most of his life here in Turin. And I think there's a street just a few blocks away um, named for Primo Levi. Anyway, he has this, um, Paul Graham tells this story that Levi told. So I have Paul Graham's retelling. I don't have the original story. He says that uh, this guy was a chemist at a company that made paints and varnishes, that kind of thing. There was an onion in the recipe for this varnish, and he had no idea why it was there. It was a big mystery, like what purpose does it serve? And nobody remembered. So he researched and he found out that many years ago they didn't have good equipment for monitoring the temperature, so they would throw an onion in, and when it fried, you know, it was hot enough. So for years after that, people had been throwing an onion into the vat of varnish for no reason whatsoever. And I think we do that in every aspect of life, including uh, computer science. So anyway, my next question is, why Elixir? And I think um, this builds on the question, why Erlang? Because Elixir runs on the same virtual machine that Erlang does. It runs on the beam. That means it's completely compatible with Erlang. 
You can call Erlang code from Elixir and vice versa. They're both just compiled down to the same, um, same byte codes. You can call the OTP from Elixir. It does have prettier syntax, which again is subjective. It does have some more modern language features and it borrows a lot of syntax and semantics from Ruby, which is, you know, you know why I was able to bridge the gap. Because I, I found myself unable to learn Erlang without a really compelling reason, but I find Elixir much more palatable, you know, you know since I already think in Ruby. So as I said, it um, borrows from Erlang and it borrows from Ruby but it also innovates. There are some features in Elixir that are, are neither from Erlang nor Ruby. Now, I hesitate to say that any of its features are really new, simply because I think all good ideas have been thought of before, and every time I think I see a new idea, I find that um, it was stolen from somebody who thought it up 20 years ago, so nothing unusual. But I would describe the relationship between these languages in this way. Erlang is like a lion. It, um, it means business, it gets things done, very powerful, strong, can be very scary sometimes. Ruby is like a beautiful, intelligent woman that you want to spend time with, you, you want to be with this person all the time. You know, maybe you agree, you know, maybe you have more of a life than I do. Um, now, if you have any classical education at all, you know that when you combine a lion and a beautiful woman, you get a sphinx. Now, there are two kinds of sphinxes in the ancient world, and I chose this kind because this kind has wings, and the wings are what I'm referring to, the wings are how I refer to the innovations in Elixir that don't come from Ruby or from Erlang. So let's look at a couple of things um, to start with. Here's how we um, define anonymous functions in Elixir. The, um, the first notation is just fn for function and end, and the code is in between. And you, um, you can call the anonymous function by specifying the variable and then a dot and then parentheses, okay? That's to distinguish it between that's to distinguish it from a function that has a name as opposed to an anonymous function that just happens to be stored in a variable. Because you can pass the variable around without calling the function. Now, there's a um, prettier syntax here at the bottom. This is um, kind of a shorthand. Here we're saying the same thing we're saying take the two parameters and add them, and that'll be a result. But the um, ampersand parentheses that says this is going to be an anonymous function, and inside that function, the parameters are simply referred to by number. So it's very intuitive, very simple. And both of those, as you can see, work the same way. Oh, and by the way, some people don't like the uh, dot parenthesis notation, but I think if you spend enough time thinking about it, you realize it's necessary, because there are times when you want to refer to the function without actually calling it. And parentheses are optional, which I think is a good thing. Anyway, there's the thing we call the pipeline operator, and it reminds me of the Unix pipe. What we're doing here is accessing a database and calling find customers. Then I say, for those customers, get a bunch of orders. And I say, for those orders, figure out the tax. 
and then prepare the filing for the income tax. Well, we've all written code like that. It's kind of ugly. It uses some unnecessary temporary variables. So we might be tempted to do it this way. You know, compose all the functions, just pass in things, and you, know, you have to read it from the inside out. You start from the deepest level of the parentheses and read outward. It's very ugly. Um, if you have kids and it's Halloween, you show them this to scare them, right? But in Elixir, there is what we call a pipeline operator, which is um, a vertical bar followed by a greater than sign, which just means take the left-hand side and pass it as the first parameter to the right-hand side, which is then omitted. So these two mean the same thing. X piped into F of Y means the same as F of X, Y, like that. So we can write, rewrite that same piece of code in this way. So what we have here is, what we're trying to do is create an income tax filing. So we find the customers, pipe that into you know, a thing that will create the orders, and then compute the sales tax, and then prepare the tax filing. So it looks like an assembly line, or it looks like a Unix pipe where you run one program and pass its output to the next one and then to the next one, like that. So it's a much prettier way of doing things. Now, you might uh, want to see some actual code here. So I'll show you a complete program and explain how it works. This program will search a dictionary for all of the anagrams in it. Um, do you know the English word anagram? Do you understand? Okay. For example, any two words that, um, whose letters can be rearranged to be the same word, like act, cat, and so on. Um, what we do here is, well, I'll explain the code from the top down, I guess. We define a module called anagram finder and inside that, we define a bunch of functions. And the first function is simply search file. So it assumes that the file is a list of words, one per line. <coughs> it, um, it calls get words, which is actually down here. Notice this is defined with def p, and the p is for private. That means it's only known inside this module. Uh, we do a, a read on the file to read in the entire file contents, do a string split to basically you know, separate it into you know, one item per, per array element. So back here in search file, we pass that result into process all. Process all just takes the list of words, it passes into a, um, a function called group by, and enum is like, is like enumerable in Ruby. It's a collection of functions that just lets you do you know, anything on a collection. That's a little complicated statement, but basically you pass in a hash dict, which is an empty, you know, a new empty data structure that will be used with this operation, and you pass in a function. And the function we're passing in says, take the characters in the string and sort them. And that is a classic way of finding anagrams. You take the, uh, the letters in the word and sort them into alphabetical order, and that becomes a signature. So that's the, um, that's the name of the bucket that all the anagrams will go in. <clears throat> now, if you, if you look next, I'm calling enum.each, which is like an iterator. It's, kind of cheating a little bit, because we don't usually think in terms of loops in Elixir, 
but this works fine. And I'm passing in the name of a function, print words. I notice the slash one at the end. That may seem very odd. Um, what we're doing here is identifying the function precisely. And the slash one says this is a function of verity one. It has only one parameter. And we do that because functions may have any number of parameters and there may be multiple functions with the same name. So that just disambiguates. Okay, so print words. Here we find something very odd. There are two functions called print words. And they, they do different things. And what happens is function dispatch happens based on how the parameters look. We're saying if the, um, if the parameter looks like a tuple in braces like that, consisting of a key and a list of words, then do nothing. Or, or rather, I should say, a list consisting of a single word. Now, the reason we do nothing in that case is that the bucket has only one element in it, so the word has no anagrams. <clears throat> but in the usual case, we're passing in a tuple, which is a key and a list of words. So we start by saying, split off the head of this list, and we use a lisp-like notation here, first and rest. This will be the head and the tail of that list. Um, we pass that into reverse. Why am I doing that? I can't remember. <laughs> I, guess, I guess I wanted them to come out in opposite order for some reason. Anyway, then I do a, a put s, and I'll say, take the first word and use that as the label, and then show me the rest of the words separated by commas. So then here I'm just calling that, passing in the standard dictionary. So I'll come back in a few minutes to that in case you have questions on it. But right now, let me go on. There are some other features in Elixir that are interesting. We can have multiple function heads, as we just saw. We can have guard clauses, which are ways of describing the parameters so that function dispatch happens properly. There are macros in Elixir, which are you know, something I haven't really gotten into yet. They're very powerful, but they've gone to great lengths to make them clearer and safer than they are in a language like Lisp or whatever. Uh, interestingly, a lot of Elixir is implemented in, in terms of its own macros. Uh, there are protocols, which are kind of like interfaces in other, language, other languages. Um, there are streams. Um, if we um, take the output of one function and pass it into another, and then into another, and another, like that, the downside is that we're still just collecting, you know, the results from one step and then passing it on to the next step. But there are streams in Elixir so that you can very easily take those steps and parallelize them. So that in other words, the whole thing will stream all at once. Um, tasks, um, there's a wrapper for the process interface. You know, Elixir has you know, the same idea of processes that Erlang has. It's tried to um, wrap everything in interfaces that make sense. And there's process supervision. If, you, um, if you're familiar with Erlang, you know the expression, let it crash. The, um, the idea is you don't try to recover from errors. You just let the, let the server crash and then whoever, 
whoever or whatever is supervising the process will see that it's crashed and start again. And that's a, um, that's a philosophy that works well in that world. Multiple function heads, as we saw a minute ago. This is um, another fine Italian, Leonardo of Pisa, who gives us the uh, Fibonacci series. Notice how the elixir definition of the Fib function mirrors so closely the mathematical definition that you see. That's because elixir, at its best, is more declarative than imperative. And what happens here is, at the time the Fib function is called, the VM is smart enough to say, if this parameter has the value zero, then I'll call the first function. If it has the value one, I'll call the second one. And for anything else, I'll call um, the third one. Now the, the bug here, of course, is you could pass in like negative five and it would never terminate, or you could pass in a string and it would crash, you know. But you get the idea. Okay, guard clauses. You can specify when and then any kind of condition, and it may be fairly complex. It just has to evaluate very quickly because it's done at function dispatch time. Like here, I'm saying when radius is a number, then circle area is defined as pi times the radius squared. Now, what, by the way, do you think would happen if you pass in something that's not a number to circle area, just as a wild guess. It's a runtime error, because there's no function that matches that. Okay, here is um, also an anonymous function with guard clauses. This simply you know, prints out whether something is a number, a binary list, or something else. And I think that's fairly intuitive how that works. Here's a macro example. And as I said, I don't know much about macros. I haven't gotten deeply into them yet. Uh, here we define a module called my macros. I define a macro called unless. And what's going on here is I'll pass in a test and an expression. And the test will be tested for Boolean, truth or false, you know, truthhood or falsehood. And then the expression will be evaluated. Now, what's, what's essential to understand is that unlike a function, a macro does not evaluate its parameters in real time. So if I um, pass some complicated expression into a macro, that won't be evaluated until later. If I pass you know, 2 plus 3, for example, I don't get 5 passed in. I get literally 2 plus 3, the tokens. So here, for example, I can say, unless 2 equals 3, do io.putS. That's a relief. You know, 2 is still not equal to 3, even for very large values of 2. What, um, what seems odd here is the comma, or it seemed odd to me, but what's going on is the parameters to the macro are simply separated by commas. So this is the first parameter to the macro, and this is the second one. And the second one is really, <coughs> really just a keyword list. It's like a, like a hash in Ruby. So that is how that works. We can help reduce the looping and branching that we do if we uh, use the features that are built into Elixir. And it makes the code look more declarative and less imperative, and it reduces the complexity of it. There's, uh, there's an expression in English that um, a tool gives you enough rope to hang yourself. You, you know that expression, maybe? No? Mm. Well, I'll just observe that uh, 
to hang yourself, you only need one branch on one loop. So here's an example. This is similar to what we've seen before. We can avoid branches by simply, uh, simply defining multiple function heads. And we avoid loop by doing smart recursion. And Elixir is tail recursive, by the way. So it does things in the proper way. Now, I'll take a short digression and say, where is this going to ultimately lead? We're doing a lot of multi-processing, which we used to not do in the past. Um, I want to go back to the very beginning of object-oriented programming, like 1967, with Alan Kay. His original vision was, you know, I'll argue that it was you know, highly concurrent. I think that he envisioned objects originally as being, you know, very concurrent, you know, asynchronous things communicating with each other. And I think we're moving toward that. I think we're moving toward a kind of fusion of functional and object-oriented styles. And you might want to read about this thing sometime. It's pretty old, like late 80s, I think, the connection machine. <clears throat> it had uh, 65,000 processors in it. And I don't think it turned out to be very practical at the time, but I think it will turn out to be practical at some point in the future. And I think this is the sort of thing where we're headed. Um, you know, we think we're cool now if our machine has like eight cores or 16 or whatever. You know, let's have 65,000.